it's a precious thing to have been invited to uh, come and to, I think I was invited to come. I might have appointed myself and then left. I don't know. Uh, I just, I just can't think of that. But uh, anyway, you heard Bill. He testified that, it, that he invited me, so I'm sticking with that, you know. And uh, boy, it does bring back memories seeing Bill back up here. We had a lot of wonderful times over the year. When John Oswalt, I knew, was uh, filling in, uh, he called and he said, Ron, do you like Bill as a choice? I said, I do like Bill as a choice and we've got a lot of experience together. He knows the society and that's huge, isn't it? Because have you ever noticed the Francis Asbury Society isn't an easy thing to define? If you all feel like you have the definition after 30 years here, let me know because some of us are still looking for it, you know. It's not, that's because after Dr. Kinlaw is done talking, Everybody said, what, what did he say? They said it was wonderful, but what did he say? <laughs> he was over our heads, but we loved it. And uh, you kind of felt that way, didn't you? We came for a cup of cold water when Dr. Kinlow was here and got hit with a fire cannon hose every time he saturated us. And, but over the years, uh, it's, been, it's been beautiful. Uh, and so, Bill, I thank you for the privilege of ministering alongside of you once again. I was honored to do it then, I'm honored to do it now. And I, I can sincerely say that uh, there are people who walk that way over the years and so their life stands as a witness. It's, it's nothing new, they don't even have to make an adjustment in their life to move over to this administration. With one exception, it is a little different living in Wilmore than in Auburn, you know. That's, a, that's one little adjustment. I mean, uh, Auburn probably has a place open to eat after 7 o'clock at 9 or something like that. I'm just, I'm guessing, Bill, I don't know. But, uh, and tonight is a special night for me for a number of reasons. But uh, one of the most special reasons is we have a grandson He's about 15 months old, but his paternal grandparents are here, sitting with Darina. This is, this is Larry and Mary Jo Grabo, and uh, wonderful. It's, it's kind of fun sharing our grandson together, it is. I, during Holy Week, had, had the privilege, you know, being an ordained elder in the Methodist Church, and they, they have attended a Methodist Church there in Lexington. So that meant, uh, that meant James Daniel, our grandson, was 11 months old. He had a mind of his own already, a will of his own. I had no idea whether he was going to let me hold him for long enough to get through the, the baptismal liturgy. And I did. We had a wonderful time. He was just a little gentleman. All the way up to that last minute, I said, well, I'm just going to kiss him and give him back to his parents. I leaned down to kiss him, and he stiff-armed my face, knocked my glasses, that church just got more joy during Holy Week watching my grandson get me. You know, he, he was into being baptized even three times with the water in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. But when old Grandpa tried to slip him a kiss, he was in no parts of that. And they laughed and laughed. It was just, uh, just beautiful. But I, all of you know that have grandchildren, what a joy it is to share that together. But the reason I bring it up is three years ago you helped me pray and Darina pray because our our daughter said that they weren't giving her very good uh, news about whether or not she could have a baby and you helped us pray and then I uh, we got the baby I mean he's a little red-headed youngster I'm not sure I can say honestly yet he looks like an angel but to us he's an angel but uh, once you hear him going down the hallway talking up a storm, you know, he's just, just perfect for us. And then two years ago, I said, it worked so beautifully. I testified in the summer, you helped us pray. And Jonathan and Katie had a little boy, but we had a, a son-in-law, have a son-in-law who was in Iraq. And, you know, the whole tar pits thing and all that. Uh, it's one of the classic 
problems and they didn't feel like uh, he may be able to father a child. And so I asked you to pray again. I said, you've prayed us through one. That's how I know you can do it. Let's pray again. And so you did. And on July 3rd, my youngest daughter had a little baby girl. And that was an answer to prayer. So you are a special part of our family group. And, you know, those aren't the only family things we've shared together. I think many of you remember when Dr. Burgess went home to be with the Lord and then Dr. Kinlaw to be home with the Lord. I'll be a little tender tonight. Be first, you've known me over the years enough to know I, I'm just a crying Methodist. I can't help it. I just do so. And you've all wept with me many times right here on this porch. And I don't have any qualms about that. But I am tender and weepy because uh, the last service, my brother Doug, who was an ordained elder in the Methodist Church, and I did, was for our father, who graduated to glory in a beautiful way. He died in his sleep, right? I mean, my brother Doug prayed over him with our family. And when my brother Doug said amen, my father breathed his last and went into glory at the end of that prayer with all of his family around him except me. I had been with him a week earlier and had to fly back to do the faculty retreat at Ohio Christian University. But my mother and my brother said, Ron, it was such a, a beautiful, beautiful witness to how good God is. No more suffering. He breathed his last and went. Well, I'm tender tonight thinking about when my father, who is no Christian, in his 40s, became a Christian. And God made all of the difference in his life in a virtual moment of time. And so it just fills me being with you all because we prayed for some of you all's loved ones. We prayed for marriages. We prayed for deaths in the family. We have prayed for those and anointed those on this back porch who needed prayer and God touched your lives. And I'm happy to be with you tonight. As a matter of fact, I said when I came back to Wilmore a third time uh, with the Francis Hasbury Society, I think this, this is just that group of people and uh, most of us at least identified in one way or another with the John Wesley Methodist, United Methodist tradition, Free Methodist, you know, all those kinds of Methodists. And, uh, and that's the group of people that prayed me into the kingdom. And I love that. And so you are a family to us. One of the joys it was in sitting in the office at the Francis Asbury Society is you all would drop a little note on how you were praying and what you were praying about. And it never failed to bless me. And so I'm so glad both Josh uh, and Bill are in that cadence again. They're going to have many blessings. But tonight... The blessing is all mine, brothers and sisters. Thank you for receiving a humble guy. I'm not worthy, but I'm filled with joy that I have this privilege. And thank you that all of you hold a very special place in our heart. And I believe I got two grandkids because the Hemlock Inn folks pray deeply in addition to our prayers. And you don't ever forget those who pray you through, do you? They become your, your partners for life. Now, I want to set this up. In pursuit of the Holy One. Now, nobody, it's, it's a secret to nobody at the Hemlock Inn that holiness has been our overarching agenda. But why? Because within Christendom, there's only about 45% of the denominations in Christendom that believe while here in the flesh, God can purify a heart so that a human being can be blameless before God. I didn't say perfect according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary. That's a big problem. People think we're talking about some kind of static perfection as defined in the dictionary. No, we're talking about a perfection that we believe God through his transforming love can enable us to love him adequately even in this life, so that we can begin to have a fellowship of love. So at the Francis Asbury Society in places like Asbury University, Wesley Biblical Seminary, 
Ohio Christian University, at the center of our doctrinal distinctness is this. We have a privilege of receiving this transforming love of God in a sanctifying way in our heart. Now we also say that happens subsequent to, to, to conversion, regeneration. Oh, that starts the big debate in Christendom because they'll talk about a second work of grace. Well, what's wrong with the first work of grace? Nothing except that he said there's some works in our lives he won't begin until the Spirit of God has moved in when we ask Jesus into our hearts. We used to sing it in our hymnology, more about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern, Spirit of God my teacher be showing the things of Christ to me. But I want to ask this one fundamental question. How can the Spirit of God teach you the things he wants to know in your life when you've not yet received the Spirit of God into you by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because of this language, often called secondness language, half of the entire Christian world is hung up because they believe we're adding some kind of an appendage when we say holiness on the salvation. But I want to say that's not factual tonight. I thought I'd take one more stab on the hemlock in at doing this picture of how we pursue the Holy One in our lives and what is the relationship. The Spirit of God comes into our hearts at conversion. But then the Spirit of God begins to teach us. Now all of you remember this. I want, I want to give you a little Bible quiz right now. I hope you do better on it than I did when Al Coppage first gave me mine in 1979 at Asbury Seminary. I, I don't know why I was a model student. You just hadn't recognized it yet. But <laughs> I'm going to talk about that in a moment. <laughs> uh, 45% of Christianity live in that unpopular, outvoted type of religion where people think it's heresy because isn't Christ enough or more than enough? Yes, he is. He surely is. Of course, the one who said he's enough or more than enough said, I have another helper I want to give you. And the world can't receive this helper. This is the spirit of truth, and the world cannot receive him. So you see, an unconverted person cannot receive the spirit of truth. Paul said, <laughs> the natural man, I'm quoting directly, the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit, meaning the unconverted one, because they are spiritually discerned. So the only reason Wesley began allowing Fletcher to go into this deeper discovery about more formally codifying the experience of sanctifying love as a second work of grace was, Wesley allowed it to be subsequent to regeneration because no unbeliever has the spirit of truth living in his heart or in her heart. The advent of the Spirit in our lives comes when we ask Jesus into our heart. Now you know Jesus in presence in space sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, if you've ever said the Apostles' Creed. But in our hearts, he lives in our heart by the presence of the Holy One, the Spirit of holiness that the world can't receive. So we have his Spirit living in our hearts because we've asked Christ to come into our hearts, and then the Spirit begins this process of teaching to us the things of Christ until we believe we have that moment in time where we can say yes to the Holy Spirit. 55% of Christendom rejects that as a teaching. Some say it's impossible for you to say that and keep it. But I want you to know this. I, uh, my next wedding anniversary will be number 42. I tell everybody, my bride, my bride gets the question all the time when we go out to speak, what's it like having been married to Ron almost 42 years? She said, if you'll do the math, that's almost six times the great tribulation. <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. She's still with me, so it must be okay. Okay. 
I lived for 27 years as a Smith, and I lived alone. And, uh, but on May the 29th, 1982, I made a vow to God. I said I'd have and hold her sickness and in health. You know how they do it. They shouldn't say this to any seminarian for rich or for poor. We're all poor, you know, after seminary. Uh, as a matter of fact, my two guys here said they couldn't drive their cars. They had to bring a school car down because I remember what those seminary automobiles can do and can't do. They had to make sure they had one that could get here all the way, right? Yeah, sure. I remember that clearly. And uh, so in the middle of it all, I said, Darina, I'm going to keep me only unto you as long as we both shall live. But do you know, there's never been a normal day for me where I haven't gone home to my bride for 42 years. Oh, sometimes I've preached out and about. Matter of fact, this has been a long road summer. I think four camp meetings and now this, the Hemlock Inn, and now I went to, with Dr. John Maxwell to Panama, you know, as they were doing a launch on teaching leaders in Panama. So I've been out on the road since the third week of June. And she got along with me, we got this grandbaby, and so she gravitated to the grandbaby. I went with John Maxwell to Panama. See, that's, uh, you see the difference in the sexes there. It's, uh, sometimes it happens that way, you know. But when I was there with Dr. Maxwell, he began talking that when Christ, through his spirit, comes into your life, it adds a value to your life. And if you've been married, you make a vow. Now, who can here say at the day of your wedding vow, you were a perfect husband or a perfect wife? Anybody here want to venture that one? I would not be in your company if you do. We, we recognize that when we take our vow, we're not perfect husbands and perfect wives. But what baffles me about 55% of Christendom, they don't believe they can make a vow of opening themselves as the bride of Christ to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit one come in. We're afraid to testify about the sanctifier in our life because we're not perfect. It causes us to stumble. But I'll tell you this, in 1982 when I made my vow to Darina, I wasn't a perfect husband. But guess what? I was perfectly married. All of the privileges pertaining to marriage were mine and were hers the day we made our vow before Almighty God. And I can easily apologize to you, honey, that I, I knew so little about what that meant over the years. We're still growing. And it's a beautiful thing to be still growing. And I, it's a beautiful thing to love her even now more than I did. I thought I loved her with everything I had back then, but my everything grew. You ever notice that? Your everything grows. And our everything is a lot more 42 years in than it was on day one. However, that one vow meant for the rest of my life I would come only home to Darina so long as we both should live. Now, one thing we don't need to get in is that that is sometimes in our Christian faith and in many of my churches over the years, people already felt like their marriages were down the drain before they ever got to know Jesus. And, you know, there was kind of a before and after, and I've worked through many, and Jesus is willing to meet us like that. That's the same God that told, told uh, Hosea to go buy Gomer off of the auction block of pros prostitution. He knows what it is when he sees unfaithfulness at work. He knows and he lives wonderfully with people in pain. And I've been able to walk with some of my parishioners to find brand new life in Jesus and new marriages in Jesus. Still, I want to say from the time I made my vow I've gone home to one person. Now, 
I can make an earthly vow one time in a church. Well, it wasn't really a church. It was Estes Chapel, Asbury Seminary. That's where we made our vow together. And that vow meant that everything changed. I had only ever lived alone, and now Doreen and I took up housekeeping together, as they say in the, in the South. And we've been at housekeeping ever since. And now our family's grown from not only beautiful children and beautiful sons-in-laws, although the captain in the army gets on me when I say he's beautiful, but uh, nonetheless, beautiful sons-in-laws and now beautiful grandchildren. We're not static. Our family is growing. But we made a vow, and the fact is it would be ridiculous when we made that vow not to assert we're married. But when we want to pursue life in the Spirit, we're afraid to make any assertions lest we can't keep it. But the Spirit comes in and He's our helper. It's like a bridegroom and a bride the rest of our lives. And He can help us through thick and thin, in sickness and health, for better and for worse, if we will. But we don't believe in the power of a vow. Now I want to say this, as I'm teaching another generation of young people about this vow, I'm saying we are egregiously under-proclaiming Christ and the work of God in our American churches. We are egregiously under-proclaiming because we don't recognize what God has promised to do through the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. And it is something second to that great act of salvation. It's actually a part of it, but they call it a second work because no first work of the Spirit is done in your life until you get converted. But that's not what the Bible talks about, about being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. That is for the person who has been clean. Look at Isaiah 35, when he talks about uh, a highway will be there, a roadway. And it'll be not for the unclean, not for any ravenous beast, but it will be for what? The one who walks that way. And so I want to ask you, when we talk about being in pursuit of the Spirit, no matter how long you've been a Christian, has our thinking been on target with what the scripture tells us about our privilege being if we, if we live in Christ. Are we living according to our privilege? Now, some will just say it's never going to happen this side of glory. But when you read the two greatest apostles that both wrote in a New Testament context, who would they be? Paul, and who else? Simon Peter. They set up what we call the kerygma of Christian faith, meaning the core essentials of the Christian faith. Now, you wouldn't even have to necessarily be a Bible major to understand this, but if you were a Bible major, you couldn't miss what I'm about to tell you now. Paul's greatest book to the church, meaning the one that was supposed to be his expose on church life, is Ephesians. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul says in his greatest book to the church, and that's not merely Ron's opinion, that's research that represents the field. Now I'm not saying you couldn't find somebody who doesn't agree with it, but I'm saying that the research in the field is so overwhelming, you'd better report that on the test or else you're not passing the test, okay? Here we go, Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In agape, in love, he predestined us for the adoption to sonship 
through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one capital O in the one he loves when we say in pursuit of the Holy One the one that's being spoken of is the one Paul is writing about here Paul saying the chosen plan even before the foundation of the world is that we should be holy and blameless and so many say well we will one day when we go to heaven that's just not what the Bible teaches and it's not what the Apostle Paul teaches the Apostle Paul said in a pastoral epistle to Titus for the grace of God that brings salvation to all people has appeared to us instructing us to live soberly righteously and godly in this present age in Paul's greatest treatise on the saving work of God justification by faith in Romans Paul says that what the flesh couldn't do because of its weakness God did by sending his son and do you know what else appears in the construct in Romans chapter 8 the word spirit appears more in Romans chapter 8 than any other place in all any other chapter in all of scripture and do you know what it says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your what what are the last two words mortal. yeah to your mortal body it's not the heavenly body after you've been raised from the dead it's the mortal body here and in the flesh but I want to say today in popular acclaim 55 percent of Christendom rejects that this is the teaching of the scripture and 45 percent believe that it's happened that and that in Christ Jesus he desires us to actually be holy people I remember I was at Princeton studying a THM and there was a great patristic scholar by the name of she was a Harvard grad Dr. Kathleen McVeigh and they and she was Roman Catholic and they said Dr. McVeigh if you had to be a president not a president a Protestant if you had to be a Protestant what kind of Protestant would you be and she pointed to me on the second row I, I Reverend Smith's kind I blushed I didn't know where she was going with this and uh, she said because Methodists believe in the perfectibility of the human soul and they don't try the heresy that Jesus is only Lord of heaven and could do it on earth even if he wanted no no that's not what the scripture says he's Lord of heaven Lord of earth and Lord of under the earth so if he's Lord of all and if he's omnipresent what's going to prohibit his lordship for being effective right on the porch at the hemlock inn tonight can any of you think think about it and if you invite him to take full spiritual control and have a deeper walk in the spirit how long is it going to take him to show up if he's already nearer than breath I remember hearing Dennis in his 50s say right here we talk about this second coming of Christ but if he's omnipresent if he's omnipresent how many believe he is omnipresent go ahead raise your hands if you believe he's omnipresent well then how long is it going to take him to get here when the second coming happens he's already nearer than breath how long is it going to take him and how long is it going to take him when his people realize that Paul said the norm in the church is that we should be holy and blameless well this summer in the several camp meetings I was privileged to be a part of and preach I studied the book of Philippians now almost everybody in the book of Philippians believe the theme is joy because 16 times in the book of Philippians Paul speaks of the word joy and many of them believe that the key verse is Philippians 4 4 you know rejoice in the Lord always again I say rejoice so that's the key verse I just I just don't believe it I don't I believe that sets up his most common theme in Philippians but I don't believe it's the key to understanding 
Philippians. And allow me to illustrate, if you will. This is Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. He told the Ephesians that he was going to make us ready for the day of Christ. By grace through faith and walking with him after we've received Christ, we can so have a life in his spirit, we can so pursue the Holy One that we can make a vow that we're yours and, and you're ours and that's what it's going to be. And I want to say again, if I could make a vow to an earthly woman, and that was going to be my binding vow for 42 years. How many people here have been married longer than 42 years? Raise your hands. Oh, man, look at this. Whew. We got patriarchs in this room, I declare. Half the room. And if your vow could be made in an earthly ceremony, no doubt the Lord has been your helper, like he said he would be. Why can't we make a vow that we will belong in all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to love God, the third person, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit will love us? Why not? If earthly children can do it, how much more the heavenly children that have received the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive as the one who is living in you. And you know how endemic, do you know how systematic that is to the New Testament theology that we believe? The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, and the one who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's the great divide. Either the Spirit lives in you or you're none of his. But the Spirit is our teacher begins to show us how to wholly in mind, body, and spirit belong to Jesus. Now, Paul says that his prayer for the Philippians is that they would grow so that the love of God in them would abound more and more. One of the reasons why I'm a Wesleyan tonight is because I don't like people of order persuasion. I love all people. And I pray that God's Spirit will help me love them like Christ has loved me. So I'm not out feuding with 55% of Christendom because they don't believe exactly as I believe. But I want to teach and I want to preach the Wesleyan truth because John Wesley and Charles Wesley believed that the most transforming thing that ever happens to any, any person that wants to be a child of God is that God's love is shed abroad in their hearts. Now, I'm going to talk about that more in the two tomorrow morning. But God's love can be shed abroad in our hearts, and Paul prays that that love would abound in us more and more. And do you know what else? That that love would be rooted in a growing knowledge. Uh-oh. There goes my de long-standing debate with my dad. He said, well, son, book learning's for you. It's not for me. He said, I was a sailor and then a truck driver. I said, Dad, I'll bet you could have beat sailor language and truck driver language if you'd have walked with Jesus the whole way. Because he can seize in our conversation. So that instead of looking like truck drivers, instead of looking like sailors, we can look like the Holy One of God who's delivered us from the boundaries of darkness and he's called us into his marvelous light. The Hebrew writer said, by now, many of you ought to be teaching, but you're so caught up in the elementary things of the, life, uh, of the Christian faith that, that you can't teach, you haven't gone deep enough. And the way we go deep enough is, he grows our mind. And remember, Wesley did not say, just so we could love him with all of our heart. You know, some holiness circles like to leave the other parts out. We're just going to love him with all of our heart. That's just not what the great command is. What is the great command? To love him with what? All of our... Now, wait a minute. 
you mean the Apostle Paul and Jesus agree about what the great commandment is? To love him with all of our minds? And he intimates in both Philippians and Ephesians that we can't love him with all of our minds unless we understand what God's purposes were in making us his children. And the purpose is pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Now I will say this, and I'm giving credit to my dear friend, and I've done it in more ways than one, but Dr. Coppage taught me John Wesley's theology, and he began trying in 1978, and he's still trying. He prayed for me tonight that I would preach the truth. And I said, Dr. Coppage, should I keep him from two hours and write a two-hour book report on that first book you made me read? He said, no, I don't think that'll go over, Ron. <laughs> How does anything go over after you eat at the hemlock inn for supper anyway, right? <laughs> oh, don't worry. I know you're on borrowed time. You're not praying about having pure minds. You're saying, oh, God, that now if you don't keep me awake while Ron finishes this, I'm going to be an embarrassment to everybody. <laughs> I know. I've been there. We're all there. But despite a really grand meal, we all can follow this one thing that a half of Christendom is missing this truth that I'm teaching about. And yet the Apostle Paul made it prevalent. And he said something has to happen in our mind as well in our, as in our heart. Why do we miss? I want to go over to 1 Peter. Let's go back there. I'm going to get now the person that's mentioned more in the New Testament besides anyone except Jesus. They tell me, at least the books I read say it. I didn't count them myself. Simon Peter listed as number two on the hit parade for the most famous in Christendom. Simon Peter, even above the Apostle Paul. But you've heard from number three, Jesus is already in heaven by by this time. So what does Simon Peter believe is a core value? You can't get past Simon Peter's first chapter of his first written book without him saying that we're to be holy just as the Lord our God is holy. He didn't get past the first chapter before he says it. The Apostle Paul didn't get past his first chapters, whether a public teaching or a private teaching. Even though in Titus that I quoted, it's the second chapter. The core values of these apostles is that Christ comes into our life not to leave us like we were when we were in our newly born again state, but by his spirit, who is the third person of God living in us, he will walk with us, he'll talk with us, he'll teach us, and he'll get us to that place where we can come to a place in our mind where we believe the Spirit has taught us that we can make a vow to the Spirit to belong wholly to him or wholly to, uh, uh, whether we're him or whether we're her, we can fully belong to the Spirit. We won't be perfect in mind, body, and spirit but will perfectly belong to the Holy Spirit. But so many people trip over the idea of perfection because they think it's a Daniel Webster or a, a Merriam Webster, not Daniel Webster, Merriam Webster type of dictionary. Uh, I doubt Daniel Webster ever said a thing about being perfected in love, so don't go there. Uh, Merriam Webster, we're, we're not perfect people. It would be it would be arrogant for us to maintain that. But because we're not perfect people doesn't mean that the spirit of truth that the world cannot leave, leave that the world cannot receive, uh, it doesn't mean that that spirit won't come in and live with us now. And he makes a vow not to leave us or forsake us, but to be the same type of work, the same type of work that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. He'll do it in us. He'll raise us in our mortal bodies. 
And the great question is this, if he wants to do that, and it's that great privilege of the church, how does it happen? Now I was laughing at Bill, I said, I think we got an objective genitive at work in our title. Oh, that's real exciting, they all, they all were so excited. Way to go, Ron. You know, this guy's a snoozer, you know, talking to me while I'm eating my hemlock M meal about an objective genitive, you know. What did, what's the difference between the objective genitive? Anybody know? We have an English teacher in here. It's a genitive that means the pursuit is done by God, not by you. Before you ever pursued the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was pursuing you. As a matter of fact, the Word says you couldn't have come to the Father to repent unless you were drawn by the Spirit. While we're yet sinners, Christ loved us, gave himself for us. I remember one time Dr. Kinlaw, he, he looked, somebody had just showed him again the print of Michelangelo and Jesus touching fingers, you know, or this hand from heaven. Dr. Kinlaw shook his head. He goes, I'd like to teach a class on that. He, you know, he could say in that Scottish voice, get those white eyebrows up. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to teach a class on that at Asbury Seminary. He said, that's heresy to believe God reached down because Michelangelo reached up. That's just not the truth of Scripture. While Michelangelo was in the pit of all pits, God reached down to him. Jesus said, which of you having a hundred sheep would not lead the ninety and nine to go and find the one who is in the lost pit? Remember when it was you in the lost pit? Maybe you remember, and some of you are praying for here for a loved one that's in the lost pit. I remember I didn't grow up in a Christian family, got all the way through high school, but I had a principal. She was a single lady principal in the inner city of Millville, and that was a bad part of the town. And I went to the bad school in the bad part of the town. And I don't say I was bad, but I will say this. She led her own detention services, and we got to know one another well <laughs> in one-on-one -on -one -on -one conversation. She'd always say, because I'd say, Miss Kimball, when are you getting married? She said, don't you dare call me an I'm a, I'm a old maid. I'm an unclaimed blessing. <laughs> she said, I'm not an old maid, Ronnie Smith. I'm an unclaimed blessing. And then she said to me, Ronnie Smith, I'm pray I don't know why they all called me Ronnie. I never told them that, but... They did in Millville, New Jersey. And she said, Ronnie Smith, I'm praying for you. That shook me up because I never, ever had one person that told me they were praying for me. I didn't grow up in a family that I knew anything about knowing prayer about. We were unchurched people, militantly so. But she said, I'm going to pray for you. And the boys in my detention center that I pray for turn out to be either cops or preachers. That scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> but by the way, my name's Reverend Ron Smith. It's nice to meet you tonight. I think I'm here because God heard a prayer of a faithful principal that prayed over her troubled detention boys. And I enjoy the life that she prayed into me because the Spirit of God, according to her prayers, would not let me go. So I ask this question. Do you think it's a need tonight for us to reclaim this great doctrine that is ours? To rightly understand the word of truth so we can divide it to people, which makes the spirit-filled life not some addition to salvation. It's the norm for the people of God. You and I can never quit looking like the world and its sinfulness sinfulness except by the Spirit, but when the Spirit comes into us, His name is holy. He is the Holy One. But do you know what? Long before we ever started to pursue Him, He's been pursuing us. Even before the foundation of the world, according to the Apostle Paul. And so the norm for us is that segment of the body of Christ that says, no, I think this thing is meant to happen in this life. It's too late if we wait until glory. We will have missed something. 
Because the Apostle Paul said it's in this present age. And he said, and we're to receive it in this mortal life. But it's no more heresy for you to say that the completing love in the Spirit of God has sanctified your heart than to say you're perfectly married, even though you know you're not a perfect husband, you're not a perfect wife. That doesn't make you any less married. We need the standard to be the biblical standard. That ought to get an amen even when we have full bellies on the, at the hemlock in. No, that was almost a good try, but you said. <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses could outdone them. Well, come on now. Say it like Christians who believe. So be it. Say amen together. Amen. amen. Of course. God has this as a normative experience for us. A normative experience. And if he's ours, and if he's Jesus' great helper, in the enterprise of changing us in mind, body, and spirit so that we might love him and love one another, what kind of peace are we forfeiting if we're not laying a hold of this? You know what could happen? Someday the hemlock in retreat could stop and you could say, remember the Francis Asbury side they always want to talk about holiness, holiness, holiness. Why? So we just someday finish the retreat and does it disappear to Protestant Christendom? Or are you one of those proponents that believe that you're the bride of Christ and the bridegroom in your soul is Jesus by the presence of his Holy Spirit? Have you made your vow? Doesn't make you a perfect Christian, but it makes you perfectly Christian. Why? Because the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive is living in us, working his good will and pleasure through us. So he says, don't be filled with wine. Be filled with the spirit of holiness. That's the pattern for the Christian life. Now, this is a book that I have out. I've had it out for a few months. This is the book I took 10, 11 years to write on Dr. Henry Clay Morrison, the founder of Asbury. You know why I wrote the book on Morrison? He led Dr. Kinlaw's father into the deeper life. And then he turned around when he was a 13-year-old praying at the altar at Indian Springs, led Dr. Kinlaw into an understanding of the deeper life. I'll never forget what Dennis Kinlaw said. Morrison had a way of teaching Christians. And he was a beautiful, beautiful, winsome, full of humor kind of grandfather type of speaker. He wasn't an old stodge at all. Oh, he was, he was a fun guy. And he led 13-year-old little boys. As a matter of fact, Steve Luce's, right over here, Steve Luce's Uncle Buddy, was a 13-year-old praying right alongside of Dennis Kinlaw at that altar at Indian Springs. And Uncle Buddy said, I can't say it like him, Ron, but I prayed for the same thing he prayed for. I said, well, who can say it like him? I'm, you know, I give him my book and it sounds like a million bucks because he can say it way better than I can say it. That was Dr. Kinlaw, wasn't it? Nobody's going to rival Dr. Kinlaw in his eloquence. But you don't have to rival Dr. Kinlaw in understanding the norm for the Christian faith that he discovered at an altar at Indian Springs camp meeting. The norm remained the norm for the rest of his life. Sometimes... He felt like he'd stepped out of the norm. But he knew Jesus wanted to bring him back into repentance so he could get back in the norm. Is the norm for you that you believe the Spirit of God has been pursuing you so that you could be filled with holiness, righteousness, blamelessness throughout your life? Now this book that I've written was spurred on by Dr. Billy Graham's 1966 World Evangelism Conference in Berlin. The wall was still up back then. And Graham was lamenting the fact that now when you say evangelist in the United States, 
People think womanizers, con artists, usury people who pilfer widows for money so they can live in six million dollar mansions and have 30 million dollar airplanes. And Graham said, look how much we've fallen. It used to be that evangelists in God's world were icons for the gospel. And he spoke about a circuit riding Methodist that rode from Glasgow, Kentucky to Perryville, Kentucky. And while he was riding, these uh, Wesley and Asbury taught these circuit riders to read the scripture. And so imagine he's riding by, reading the scripture, and there's this 13-year-old boy out in the field, already widowed because he lost both parents in the Civil War. And a circuit rider's riding by, and he's plowing a cornfield for his grandfather, who took him in, already orphaned at a young age. And the circuit rider's riding by, and all of a sudden this 13-year-old out in the field Here's a scripture like this. Great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. In the city of our God. In the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. The city of the great king. The 13-year-old said when the circuit rider passed, I fell down on my knees in my grandfather's field and I gave my life to God. That 13-year-old boy was the boy that led Dennis Kinlaw and Buddy Luce, Albert L. Luce, Jr., at an order of sanctification to talk about the Spirit of God leading them when they were 13 years of age. Dr. Morrison went on to establish Asbury Seminary and this last year was the centennial celebration of Asbury Theological Seminary. And on their, their uh, podcast, they interviewed the work uh, I had done about Morrison and what a privilege it was. But Billy Graham said to these people in 1966, it's a tragedy in America what 13-year-old boys see when they see the word evangelist. Womanizer, people that con people for money, in it for themselves, or a circuit rider riding by with so much power and anointing of God on them that little boys repent, fall down and give their hearts to Christ. And Asbury Theological Seminary has trained more Methodist pastors than all of the Methodist-owned schools combined. Don't tell me that it's not possible, even if it were a 13-year-old, that could make a vow to say, that's the bridegroom of my soul. If I could do it with a woman, and I've kept that vow inviolate as God's word demands. I can do it for the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. I can do it for my God. And do you know something? Once I begin to pursue that, I find that he's been pursuing me and he's been pursuing you all along. Bill said something to me in a class way, way back when he was at Asbury Seminary. He said, I think people believe Jesus is the pearl of great price, but I think it's us. I think Jesus puts that kind of premium on you. Is that what you said, Bill? I believe he did. And then he looked at me and said, you don't agree with me, do you, Ron? And I said, I didn't say that. He said, well, you didn't say you did agree with me. I said, no, I didn't say that. You kind of you hit me, man. You washed over me. I'm thinking about that. But tonight, I believe Bill is dead right. So I think you got a good president for the Francis Asbury side. Because I've been in a debate with him in my mind for 50 years. Well, 45. And I think he was right. I think tonight you're the pearl of great price. And the spirit of God who is the spirit of truth 
the helper that Jesus sends to you that the world cannot receive? He looks at you as his prize above all else. Do you believe even in your spiritual condition you are being looked down on from the halls of heaven as the greatest prize that the Godhead would want to know? And I believe that's truth. I believe that's gospel. Now here's the question. If he wants to know us that badly at this level, why is half of Christendom rejecting it? I don't know. But I'm preaching to a portion of the 45%. It may be my last time with FAS. Not because I have anything in the works or plans. I'd love to keep on coming as long as I have life and breath. But if it's the last time, I want to say something to you eternally of significant consequence. The Spirit of Truth would like your vow that you'll give the Holy Spirit permission to have all of you, the same as you gave a mate or your parents gave their, to one another a vow that they would be owned by one another. You can be owned by the Spirit of Truth that the world cannot receive. It's foundational for Peter. It's foundational for Paul. And it's the norm, not the exception. So if we're going to pursue the Holy One, it starts with you making a vow that you know who the pursuer is, and that's the Spirit. And He wants us to say yes. Maybe the burden we've been carrying can change as we pray over it here. Maybe the strength we need because it's not easy in a world torn with conflict and heresy in the church we get the, the wrong end of that and it makes us angry and we're ready to go, you know, go. Instead of love like Jesus loved. Oh, you can, you can love your friends, even the world can do that, but I say love your enemies. And Jesus can help even a guy like Smith, you know, suspended by a whole first year at Asbury University for getting in fist of cuffs. On a, in an athletic enterprise that landed me on the bench for a year. Can God take that person? Who's to say that wouldn't have been the chair of my board if the chair of the board made me mad? Who's, it, who's to say it wouldn't have been, you have to forgive my New Jersey slang, slang an old goat-headed member in one of my congregations, you know, where Jesus said, I'll, one day I'll separate the sheep from the goats, but every pastor has a few old goats he wished could be separated earlier. Maybe I'd be like Moses and want to help him out. Get him in my hand and start throttling him. I remember getting down alongside my sofa at Asbury Seminary. And I said, if you can't take this anger, if you can't take this defensiveness, if you can't take the retaliation out of my soul, I can't be a minister of the gospel. And you know, he began something in me there. And he hasn't had me slip. Don't you think it's good news tonight? The former president, three times of FAS, never strangled a board member or anything like that. I'm testifying tonight. That's the work of God's spirit. We laugh when it's about me and my hot head. But what about you all at your weakest point? Do you think your weakest point can stand up and rival Almighty God? If you do, that's called idolatry. Or do you believe that Almighty God, the Holy One, wants it? And He wants you. And He loves you with an everlasting love. And before the foundation of the world, He had already in His mind perfected the plan of a lamb without blemish coming to be slain so that we could have life everlasting. And the same spirit that worked with the second person of God in salvation itself is the same spirit that will come into your life in salvation itself in your heart. And he said he'll do in you what he did for Christ Jesus. I've got to believe that's gospel. And so I leave it with you tonight. Pursued by the Holy One so that you could be the holiness and righteousness of God in this present world. Danny, would you come and play something? And then after, 
you come and play. Uh, and we're going to sing. Then I just want us to, tonight, let's say just 10 or 15 minutes tonight, although if you feel like praying longer, you certainly may. But I want us to split up like we do, fours or fives. Just pick four or five people and pray before you go to bed tonight. But let the theme of your prayers be this. Is the pattern that is God's pattern for holiness in our lives the one that's at the center of our faith? And if not, wouldn't you want to use the prayer time tonight just to invite him in on a new part of the journey? What new victory does he have for you here tonight? What deeper work does he have for you here tonight? If you'll just invite him in. And wouldn't you like to tell him you'd like to make a vow that was just as consequential as an earthly marriage vow? I want a vow to be yours preeminently and exclusively the rest of the days of my life. Wouldn't you like to belong to God like that? Danny, you teach us what we're going to sing, if you will. And then uh, after we sing, I'm just going to let us split up into some, some groups for 10 or 15 minutes and pray.